Hi, this is Eric Smith. This is the fourth video in a series of videos I'm doing about uh, the situation concerning George Floyd and racism. And in the first three videos, if you've watched them already, and if you haven't, um, please go back and watch those videos. It is on my YouTube channel and uh, you will find it there. Um, and those videos, I'm, I was speaking about how Christians should speak about these issues um, to the world. Many Christians were making comments on social media, they were making videos, they were on Facebook, YouTube, and other places, and they were saying things, and please let me be clear, I'm sure they're, very, they're being very sincere. Um, I think they have a zeal and a desire for this situation with George Floyd and racism to be addressed. The problem is if we do not address it biblically, then we're sounding just like the world. So I want to say this again, um, be prayerful about this situation. Um, know that we need to keep the world in prayer. First and foremost, uh, the world is unsaved and they need to come to repentant faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, the second thing is, um, I may not say everything that I want to say. I may not cover all the points that I want to cover. There's so much to talk about and I'm sure I've missed some things. Um, I may have misspoke or, of course, read a, a wrong Bible verse or not even able to talk about the, Bi the Bible verse as thoroughly as I would like to. Um, please forgive me for that. But know this, these videos, first and foremost, above all, is directed to the church. It's directed to Christians. I know some unsaved people might, you know, click into YouTube and see George Floyd and racism because it's under the title and want to you know view it and that's fine I hope they do view it and I, I hope that it will lead them to salvation in Jesus Christ but this is directed to the church the first three videos uh, again I was talking about how Christians should speak uh, to the world about it and they should speak biblically and I hope I outlined all the reasons but now in the next uh, video or two I think I'm just gonna do two I'm going to talk about how Christians should speak about this in the church amongst one another. It's a little different dynamic there. And I want to say ahead of time, there are people in the church that this affects personally. There's people that may, um, they may be facing this kind of racial prejudice. They may have faced it before they were saved. They may still be facing it now. There's people in the church that feels like it's not a serious issue and they think the their other brothers and sisters in the Lord as well as the world is overreacting. I don't ascribe to that either. Race, racist prejudice exists in the United States of America. It would be foolish to say that it doesn't. I hope I outline why we need to address it biblically, but let's not for a minute think that it doesn't exist. So as Christians in the church, we want to be able to speak to one another about this issue and in the same way we want to address it biblically. Understand something, we address this issue to the world to ultimately bring them to salvation. But we address this issue to the church as part of their sanctification. There's a difference. If I'm talking to an unsaved person about this, I hope I bring Bible verses to bear to bring them to the cross so I can tell them the joy of John 3.16. But if you're a believer in Jesus Christ, we need to talk about this situation as part of your walk, as part of you being conformed into the image of Christ, as part of your sanctification. So we do not want to ignore, in the church, experiences, emotions, or even a call of action. We do not want to ignore that. We want to address all those things. We want to address people's experiences. We want to address their emotions. We want to address all those things that pertain to this subject. And I'm sure a lot of people have been talking about George Floyd and racism. And again, because Christians are commenting on social media, it shows you that the church is paying attention to it. We just want to pay attention to it biblically. So now I want to address four things in this video uh, to start us off. Four things. The four things are this. What is the problem? What is the battle? What is our position? 
and what is our vocation. These are four things that we need to establish before we go any further about particulars, how Christians should talk to one another. So let's start with what is the problem. As I spoke in the other videos, racist prejudice is a sign of a wicked heart. It's sin. We should speak about it as sin and a problem of the heart because that's what it is. That's why I was bringing up verses, and please, Christians, read these verses. Uh, Romans 3, 9 through 20, Jeremiah 17, 9, Ephesians 2, 1 through 3. This all talks about the sinful condition of man. 1 John 3, 4 says sin is the transgression or the breaking of God's law. We have to understand that any sin, whether it's prejudice, whether it's violence, murder, or even hatred, are sins that God will judge. So it's completely fine <clears throat> to address those sins in the church. So when someone starts talking about racial prejudice, we have a category for it. It's sin and we need to talk about it. And remember that this sin actually comes from the heart of the unsaved person. Sin is not only what they do, a verb. Sin is who they are. It's a noun. It's our nature. And that's why we need salvation in Jesus Christ. And guess what? If an unsafe person is not trusted in the Lord Jesus Christ, they are condemned already. And I want to read that verse, John 3.19. <clears throat> Excuse me, something in my throat. I'm going to start at verse 18. He that believeth on him is not condemned, but he that believeth not is condemned already, because he hath not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. Now we might read this and say, wow, they're condemned because they don't believe. That's not what it's saying. It's saying they're condemned already. If they don't believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, they're already condemned. And verse 19 says, and this is the condemnation that light is come into the world and men love darkness rather than light because their deeds were evil. Men's deeds are evil. Men are wicked. They're depraved. They're, they're sinners. Now that doesn't mean man is going to do every wicked, sinful thing that they can do. The person that might have Rachel's racial prejudice may not ever steal. But the person that steals may never murder. The person that would never murder you know, would they perhaps they're going to commit adultery. Uh, I may be misspeaking here, but you get the point. There's people that will do one sin and won't do another sin, but their nature is a nature of sin. I want to read Romans 8, 7 through 8, because I want to talk about the heart, the mind of an unsafe person. This is Romans 8, 7 through 8. Because the carnal mind is enmity against God, for it is not subject to the law of God, neither indeed can be. So then they that are in the flesh cannot please God. The word enmity means hostility. The carnal, natural mind is hostile against God. It absolutely is. It's hostile. That's why people sin. Because, again, sin is the breaking of God's law. And this verse says, that mind is not subject to the law of God. It won't submit to it. It's going to break it all the time. That's why no one in the flesh can please God. This is the, the nature and the situation for sinners. And we have to remember that. John 15, 18 through 23, these are Jesus' words. He actually told Christians, if the unsaved world hates you, don't marvel that it does, because it hated him first. And if it hates him, it also hates the one that sent Jesus, which is God the Father. So do you catch that? Out of Jesus' own mouth, where we see it sometimes in red letters in our Bible, he says the unsaved world hates him, hates God the Father, and hates Christians. That is why we proclaim the gospel of Jesus Christ to the unsaved person. Because only God can give them a new heart and a new mind through the preaching of the gospel. It is God that saves them and that regenerates them. But only through the gospel can that happen. Without the gospel, without the word of God, the unsaved mind is always going to hate God. 
So in the church, as we're talking about sin and we're talking about racism, that particular sin or uh, racist, uh, racial prejudice, because again, as I've said in the last two videos, there's no such thing as race. Biblically speaking, it's not a biblical category. People are of diff different ethnicities, ethnicities, I'm sorry, I can't say the word. Um, they have different languages, different cultures, and they even have different skin tones, but that skin tone is actually the same skin tone and it's dependent upon how much melanin you have in your body if your skin is light or dark. So it doesn't ever say in the Bible that people have races, uh, that there's races. And when you put ism at the end of race, that's a thought of mind. So that's a thought of what you're thinking. Um, excuse me, um, it's of what you're thinking. And people, the unsaved people, think that we're divided up in those things, races, like we're animals or something. It's Darwinian. But we're not. We're all made in the image of God. Genesis 127. We're made in the image of God. So the first thing is, that's the problem. The problem is, racism, as the world defines it, is a sin problem. I know you hear people say it's a sin problem, not a skin problem. They're not trying to be trite, and I know it sounds trite, and we shouldn't say it in a trite way, but it's true. It is not the color of someone's skin. It's not the shade of their skin tone that causes that kind of hatred where someone has partiality. And when we're talking about it in the church, whether we've experienced it or someone else is belittling that experience, we have to understand that it's a real problem and it's sin. So that's how we begin our conversations with one another in the church that it's a sin problem. So what is the battle? Well, the battle is this. We can look at the unsaved world and see them do these things. We can watch the officer put his knee on George Floyd's neck and think, it's all the police. It's all the police. They're all racist. There's police brutality. We could look at George Floyd and go, oh, see, that African-American was just a troublemaker, and that's why that happened, and all African-Americans are troublemakers. Do you see how we can start thinking about things as if it's all partial, whatever we think it is, as if these people that are out here in the world aren't our mission field? Listen, George Floyd, that police officer, the people that are rioting, the people that are out there even speaking against the rioting that's not saved, they all need salvation in Jesus Christ. They do. So it's a battle. And I'm going to show you from the scriptures that it is a spiritual battle. Go to Ephesians chapter 2. Uh, I've quoted this verse, these verses a few times and it needs to be quoted again. In Ephesians chapter 2, the Apostle Paul is giving the Christian his past tense life before he was saved. And starting at verse 1, I'm going to go to verse 3, it says, And you hath he quickened, and that means made alive, who were dead in trespasses and sins. Where in time past he walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience, among whom also we all had our conversation in times past, in the lust of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature the children of wrath, even as others. When we were unsaved, Christian, this described us, and this describes the world now. They're run by the devil who runs the world. So any secular viewpoint, any philosophy, anything that is going to tempt us to sin are doctrines of demons. And the world is following after that. And, and check it out. It says, the lust of the flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind. The lust of the flesh and the desires of the flesh and of the mind. It's sinful. That's our viewpoint. We're just sinful in our minds. That's why these two verses cause us children of disobedience and children of wrath. Because we disobey God's word and we're deserving of God's wrath. But notice back in verse 2, it says, The spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience. This is spiritual warfare. It's spiritual, and the Bible tells us that. 
In fact, staying in the book of Ephesians, let's go to chapter 6, and I'm going to read verses 10 through 12. Familiar verses, it's the introduction before uh, God, uh, as he speaks through the Apostle Paul, tells us to put on the whole armor of God. Verse 10 reads, Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. Do you notice we're, put, we're supposed to put on the armor of God because it's the wiles of the devil that we're fighting against. And then in verse 12 it says, For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. The Bible saying that this is a spiritual battle. The devil is the tempter. The devil is the wicked one. He is going to run this unsaved world. He is tempting unsaved people to do the very thing they want to do, and that's sin. And you know what that pertains to? The person that has ra racial prejudice, the person that wants to riot and loot, the person that wants to get on the internet and talk about it, and they don't know God, it's all a scheme of the devil and demons. Now, I know the unsaved world would hear that and think, that's crazy. But you know what? As Christians, we have to understand that. We have to understand that, that that's wickedness of the devil. We have to remember what the Bible says about that, too. The unsaved world is run by the wicked one. Now, God is in sovereign control of all of it. But unsaved people, sinful people, are following after the tempting and the moving of what the devil wants. Because the devil is a liar. The devil is defiant. In fact, he wants to be like God. He always wanted to be like God. So we have to remember what the Bible says about partnering or acting or sounding like the world. I want to read um, a verse that might seem kind of startling in uh, the book of James. Let me get here. James 4.4 4 says, You adulterers and adulteresses, know you not that the friendship of the world is enmity with God. Whosoever therefore will be a friend of the world is the enemy of God. Do you catch what this verse is saying? If you want to be friends with the world, you become an enemy of God. Christians, we're not supposed to be friends with the world. Now, that's not saying that you can't have acquaintances and friendships because you want unsaved people to be saved. It's not what it's talking about. It's talking about being friends with them in terms of the ways of the world and the ways they, they act and sinful things that they do. That's why 1 John 2, 15 through 17 says, Love not the world or the things of the world, because it's of the flesh. So we're not to be friends with the world. We're not supposed to love the world system. Romans 12, 2 says, Don't be conformed to the world. Don't be conformed to the world system. Don't act like them. And that word conformity basically means it's like cramming a square peg in a round hole. You're the square peg and the round hole is the world, and it just doesn't fit. 2 Corinthians 6, 14 through 18, you know what it says? Don't be unequally yoked with unbelievers. Now, many times we'll, we'll look at those verses and things, it's just talking about marriage. And it is. It's primarily saying don't marry an unsaved person. But at the same time, you're not supposed to partner with unsaved people in any enterprises. We're not supposed to be gathering with them politically and, and acting like them. And when it says, it doesn't mean that Christians can't run for office and Christians can't talk to unsaved people about things but what it says is you don't be unequally yoked and what it means is you don't be with someone that's going in one direction and you're going another direction they're carnal you're spiritual and if they want you to act carnal or think carnal and you start doing that then guess what now you're yoked up with someone that's an unbeliever unequally yoked means you're going in a spiritual direction and they're going in a carnal direction it just doesn't mix 2 Corinthians 10, 3 through 5. I want to go to these verses because it tells us how to deal with that. 
And I want you to notice the language here. For though we walk in the flesh, we do not war after the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds, casting down imaginations and every high thing that exalted itself against the knowledge of God, and bringing into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. You catch this verse, these verses are saying the same thing that Ephesians was talking about. We don't walk in the flesh. I mean, though we walk in the flesh, that we have, you know, bodies, we do not war after the flesh. And that's our sin nature. Our weapons of warfare are not carnal. We don't act like the carnal, unsaved person. And we don't think like them and talk like them. But it's mighty through who? God. And that's why we're supposed to take every high thing that exalted itself against the knowledge of God. So that means any unsaved way of thinking is exalting itself, what? Against the knowledge of God. We have to bring those thoughts, captivity, to the obedience of Christ, to the obedience of His Word. That's what we're, we're called to do. So we know the problem is sin. We know that the battle is spiritual. So what is our position? So when we start talking to one another in the church and we know what the problem is and what the battle is we need to also remember our position in Christ and I want to read two verses to you these are two verses that personally helped me when I was first saved and I faced a lot of things um, you know I faced racial prejudice I faced people not liking me and people being in cliques and people people being partial and you will take those thoughts into the church. I was unsaved for 40 years. So that's 40 years of unsaved thinking, and I'm bringing that in the church. And these two Bible verses helped me. First one is uh, Galatians 3.28. It reads, There is neither Jew nor Greek, there is neither bond nor free, there is neither male nor female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. Did you catch that? Now, it's not saying that people aren't Jew or Greek or Gentile in their ethnic background. It's not saying that they're not bond or free because some people are still servants and there's some people that are free. It's not saying that someone's not male or f female. <laughs> we are. What it's saying is those titles... Those things do not take preeminence over your position in Christ. First and foremost, we are believers in Jesus Christ. That takes precedence. That takes preeminence over the, the skin tone, my ethnic background, my culture, my gender, my social status, being a Christian is above all those things. I'm going to go to Colossians now. Similar verse. Colossians 3.11. Actually, I'm going to start at verse 10. It says, um, well, you know what, I'll start at verse 9 so we can get the whole context. Lie not one to another, seeing that you have put off the old man with his deeds, and have put on the new man, which is renewed in knowledge after the image of him that created him. See, we're made in the image of God. Where there is neither Greek nor Jew, circumcision nor uncircumcision, barbarian, Scythian, bond or free, but Christ is all and in all. Again, our position is in Jesus Christ. So when we start talking about a problem of racism, injustice, everything. We are not to act like our position is the same position that people in the world have. Listen to these things that the Bible says, or I should say, listen to these labels, these titles, our position in Christ. This is what the Bible calls us. He calls us the church, and that Greek word means ekklesia, and, those, and that means the called out ones. Christ has called us out from sin, saved us by his grace and mercy, and now we're set apart. We're called the elect, the chosen of God. 
It's what Ephesians 1 4 says that God the Father chose us in Christ before the foundation of the world. We're the beloved. That means we're greatly loved by God. We're called saints, and that also means that we're set apart for God's purposes, set apart for holiness, righteous living. We're called the children of God and the children of light. I want to read these verses that talk about that. John 1.12 But as many as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name. God gave us the power. We're adopted by God because we believe. We are sons of God. And that just means sons and daughters. We're children of God. I want to also read um, Romans 8, 14 through 15. I'm going to go back to Romans. For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. Catch that, Christian? If you're led by the Spirit, and you should be, you're sons of God. For you have not received the spirit of bondage again to fear, but you have received the spirit of adoption, whereby we cry, Abba, Father. And Abba just means Father, so it's like Father, Father, uh, a term of endearment. Our Heavenly Father is so wonderful that we cry out to Him because we're His children. I want to go back to Ephesians now. Ephesians 5.8 But you were sometimes darkness, but now are ye light in the Lord. Walk as children of light. Do you notice that we're called children of light? Remember earlier in John chapter one, um, chapter 3 I read that verse that the unsaved people hate the light because they love darkness and their deeds were evil when God saves you you become a child of light and first Thessalonians 5 5 actually says the same thing so who who are we what's our position we're Christians first and foremost so when we start talking about the problems that's, that um, plague the sinful world, particularly racial prejudice and violence and hatred, we have to remember that we are all one in Christ. We're Christians first and foremost before we start talking about these things. And we can talk about those things, but after we hear the matter from someone and listen to them about those situations in the church, and please do listen. If someone talks to you, listen. We remind that other believer of our position. So, before we talk about these things, we have to know what the problem is, what the battle is, what the position is. And now we have to understand what our vocation is. Staying in Ephesians, I want to read Ephesians 4. I'm going to read verses 1 through 6. I therefore, the prisoner of the Lord, beseech you that you walk worthy of the vocation wherewith you are called, with all lowliness and meekness, with long suffering, forbearing one another in love, endeavoring to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. There is one body and one Spirit, even as you are called, and one hope of your calling, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is above all and through all and in you all. A vocation is normally an occupation, what you do. For the Christian, the vocation is the calling, the effectual call of God unto salvation. And now it says, walk worthy of that calling. It basically says, walk like a Christian, and you'll walk like a Christian according to the truth of God's word, John 17, 17, and the leading of the Holy Spirit. Because we have one Lord, one faith, one baptism. One God and Father of all. Do you see how everything is one? We're all one in the Lord. So we're supposed to be led by the Word of God. And first and foremost, Christians, you know who guides and directs us to walk and talk and walk and talk in holiness like a Christian? 
It's our pastors, our elders, our bishops, and our churches. They're made our shepherds. Jesus Christ is the shepherd. But we have shepherds in our local churches that are supposed to teach us all these things. And they're supposed to guide us in the word. This is directed right now to pastors, elders, and bishops. 1 Timothy 3, 1 through 7, Titus 1, 6 through 9, Ephesians 4, 11 through 16, and 1 Peter 5, 1 through 3 are qualifications and responsibilities to the elder, the bishop, and the pastor. If you read those set of verses, nowhere do you see a pastor or a bishop called to address these issues of racism and violence and police brutality based on the way that they're doing it. We are supposed to be biblical because we're the church. We're to represent Jesus Christ because the church is his body and Christ is the head. And as the shepherd of the church, we're not supposed to be commenting on social media and sounding like the world. If you sound like the world to the world, you're going to sound like the world to your congregation. And I want to just read the one set of verses from Ephesians that talks about this. Ephesians 4.11, starting here. And he gave some apostles and some prophets and some evangelists and some pastors and teachers. Now I want you to key in on pastors and teachers. For the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ. You catch the job? For the perfecting, and that's the maturing of the saints, for the work of the ministry, and for the edifying of the body. Verse 13, till we all come in the unity of the faith and the knowledge of the Son of God unto a perfect man, unto the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. The leader in the church is to teach and preach and guide and direct so we can all come to the unity of the faith. If we let people bring in worldly thoughts about racism, police brutality, any sin issue, any sin issue, they're violating this verse because they're need, they need to teach us and guide us and, and help us in our sanctification so we can grow in holiness. Look at verses 14. That we henceforth be no more children tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine by the slight of men and cunning craftiness whereby they lie in wait to deceive. When unsaved thinking comes in the church, it's a deception and we're falling for it. But verse 15 says, But speaking the truth in love may grow up into him in all things, which is the head, even Christ. We're to speak the truth in love. We're supposed to speak the truth in love to the world so they can be saved, and we speak the truth in love to the fellow believers so they can be sanctified. Nowhere in the Bible does it tell the leaders of the church to protest with the unsaved, to be partial to one ethnic group over another, or address any sin issue without the Word of God, or adding worldly thinking to the Word of God. So pastors... Bishops, elders, stick with the word of God. Don't lean on your own understanding. Don't go by your emotions. Because there's people that are emotional that need biblical answers in your churches. And Christian, you're to walk worthy of the vocation. You want to read the things that you need to do? Read Romans chapter 12. Read Ephesians 4 and 5. There are marching orders for Christians all over the place. And we're not following those verses when it comes to this matter. And we need to in the church. If we don't do it in the church, we're not going to shine our light as children of light to the world. Now, I know many people are hearing these things. And, and they may be watching this video and you're hearing this. And again, you may be thinking I'm insensitive or that I'm being one-sided. I am not. Again, racism, it's going on out there. 
there could be police brutality in some instances. It's real. Just like rioting and looting is wrong, and that's real too. But in the church, we need to discuss it biblically. So we have to know what the problem is, what the battle is, what our position is, and what our vocation is. And in the next video, we're going to, you know, it's going to be the rubber meets the road. We're going to take situations where Christians are going to be talking about this situation and talking about George Floyd and talking about racism and talking about all these things. And what we're going to do is look at what the Bible says about those things and how we need to address one another as believers in Jesus Christ. We, know, we don't need to address things like the world. In the church, we need to address it in the right way. Now again, if anybody's watching these videos and you disagree with something I said or you think I missed a point, please leave comments. I, I would love to read the comments. I will even take correction. I'm sure I'm not covering everything. That's why I'm making so many videos. I'm trying to be biblical and thorough, but I'm sure I'm missing something. And please know that I take the situation out here seriously. I take um, what happened to George Floyd seriously, and I take um, race, racial prejudice seriously. I take it seriously, but we need to be biblical about it. I want to take a moment to end with this, excuse me, with this one thing. I saw a YouTube video where they were showing George Floyd's funeral. And the title of the video was, um, there was a gospel singer that was singing, and it says, Singing at George Floyd's Homecoming. Now, I don't know if George Floyd knew the Lord Jesus Christ. There's fruit to salvation, and from some things I've heard about him, and again, I'm not going to judge it because I would have to know more, but it would seem as if he truly wasn't saved. We need to know if, as a church, before we do funerals or make comments, let's not assume that George Floyd was saved, the officer that killed him that was saved, that particular politicians are saved. We don't know that and we just can't ascribe salvation to people because we're being partial and we like their view about a particular thing. Whether those views may be called liberal or conservative, listen, we're biblical first and foremost. And that was grieving to me because if George Floyd knew the Lord, then he is going home. But if George Floyd didn't know the Lord Jesus Christ and that church is saying it's a home going, uh, um, a home going or a homecoming or whatever, what they don't realize is that he's being punished eternally in the lake of fire. We need to be careful as a church about being biblical. So pastors, Christians, if you're going to comment about this situation, know what the problem is, what the battle is, what our position is, and what our vocation is, and be biblical before you speak. You do that outside of the church, and you definitely have to do it inside the church because we're to edify one another as Christians. Until I get to the next video, thank you for watching. Keep all this in prayer, and God bless.